All right, Entree Architect community, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, which means it's time for the Entree Architect Context and Clarity Live conversation for Thursday, January 12th, 2023. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. As you get here, say hi. Let us know that you're here and let us know where here is for you. Where are you joining this conversation from? If we've never met or if we've never met before, my name is Jeff. I'm in Indianapolis. I come here every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern for one reason, so that we can find clarity around the things that matter most to you, the architect. It doesn't matter if you're the employee of a firm or you own your own firm. It's that time of year again. Maybe you circle a date on the calendar. You said 2023 is my year and uh, you're on the runway to starting your own thing. Or maybe you have owned your own firm for a year or 10 years or 47 years, and you're starting to rethink or reimagine what that firm could or maybe even should be. All of the topics that we cover, one topic every day, they all fall under the broad umbrella of the business of architecture, and they're all the need-to-know topics for the success of entrepreneur architects just like you. So thanks for joining us today. And as usual for these conversations, I am joined here by Catherine McPhail. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Jeff. Where are you today, Catherine? I am in the home studio at Fairhaven, Massachusetts. That sounds like a very fair place. Yes, fair it's a Haven, lovely place. We've got some seagulls outside. It's a little bit oh, wow. glowery today, I would say. Oh, okay. Yeah, it sounds like we, we don't have seagulls. We don't have ocean water. No. <laughs> we got, we've got water falling from the sky. Lots of it. But Oh, yeah, we um, don't. It's just kind of looks like it's going to rain but you know what i got for my birthday this year was a uh membership in the cloud appreciation society have i already mentioned that no what in the world is cloud appreciation society well it's just what it says it's people who love clouds and get together to appreciate them but so it's pretty pretty fun because now when i look up i just don't see gray clouds i try to figure out what kind of cloud it is and then i can look up my i'm getting um all sorts of information about a cloud identification and that's people nice. who care well, about it instead of just random people that I'm friends nice with. Nice little uh, shift of perspective there. Clouds are the best. I think they're so great. Okay. Yeah. Here in the Midwest, right. this time of year, we talk about it's permacloud mm. from about, you know, late October through at least April. So is it really? We might need a little, yeah, we might need a little cloud appreciation around here. Mm. It's hardest. Those aren't really the most appreciable, appreciable clouds. Yeah. Possibly, <laughs> I get it. But anyway, it's totally pretty cool because all over the world, the clouds are different, which makes sense. Interesting. Interesting. Mm-hmm. We need to do a, a whole, uh, need to do a whole talk on that. Maybe. <laughs> oh yeah, we really do. <laughs> Not today. Well, as I uh, look at our guest list here, I see Chris Novelli. He says, he's, hello, from the road back from Vermont. Chris went skiing this morning. So I don't know if he's on the road in his car or if he just missed and he's just going down the road on his skis. But Chris, <laughs> welcome going. back. Uh, safe travels. You're the first in the room today, at least officially, judging from our screen here, which means you're the winner of today's John Kenny Memorial Crocheted Bathtub Award. So congrats, Chris. Hope the ski trip was a lot of fun. I see uh, Scott Thrift is joining us. He says, temporary refrain from the deluge in San Francisco. Scott's Mm -hmm. over there on Twitch and in San Francisco. So welcome back, Scott. Stay dry out there. Mark R. LePage. He says, howdy, partners. (laughs) Mark is changing his location this week just based on his introduction. He's been in Australia Mm -hmm. for a couple of days. It was good day and now it's howdy. Maybe he's out west. Um, um, so howdy, Mark, but I'm guessing probably Waxhaw, North Carolina is where he is. Tim Stockton's in stock or Tim Dearborn is in Stockton, California, or Tim Stockton's in Dearborn, Michigan. I don't know which John Jones is, uh, he's leading from behind. He says in Westport, Connecticut, right across the street from Starbucks, by the way, I want to know if you uh, were able to take a break and get your iced Americano today. John Jones. He said he couldn't yesterday. I'd like to know how many Starbuckses there are in Westport, Connecticut, and would it be hard to find John? If there are five, I think I could find John. I'd just go to each one and look for him. Yeah, you know, I don't know. My guess, not knowing anything at all about Westport, Connecticut, my guess is one in Westport, um, which would make mm, no, it really I, easy to find John, but I don't know. No, I'd say at least three, at least three in Westport, okay. Connecticut. All right, John, how many Starbucks? We all want to know how many Starbucks 
Inquiring minds, that's what I was trying to think of. Inquiring minds <laughs> want to know how many Starbucks are in Westport, you know, I Connecticut. Could ask Mr. Google about that too, but anyway. Uh, the magic Google box knows all. Uh, mm-hmm. Kurt is also joining us from Twitch. That means we've got a big, big audience on Twitch today. Good afternoon from Flint, Michigan. Arturo, welcome from San Diego. He's over on the YouTube side, as is Greg Burke from San St. Augustine, Florida. Tim O'Gara on LinkedIn from Chicago. Awesome. Uh, Yoko is in Alexandria. Welcome back, Yoko and Jessica from sunny South Florida. Good for you. <laughs> See you tomorrow. I think. Nice for you. Must be nice. <laughs> yeah, it must be nice. Uh, Gene, welcome back from Houston and Rod's in Monroe, Louisiana. He says he had some dreams. There were clouds in his coffee. Clouds in clouds his coffee. In- uh, Christian is Ithacating Ithaca- today. Welcome back from Ithaca, New York, Christian. And um, John says, yes, three Starbucks in town. Catherine for the win. Congratulations. Yep. Feels and like a I'm- three Starbucks town to me. All right. I'll, I'll have to visit. We'll hit them all. Um, and unfortunately, Catherine, hmm. in South Florida where Jessica is, there no are clouds. no clouds to appreciate. Yeah, Sorry about that. That happens down there. It does. But they also sometimes have really great ones. Uh, they have some some really wicked ones at times as well. Yeah. Well, it's great to have all of you with us. Thank you for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation as usual. Um, I will give you a little heads up before we get started, just real quickly. Tomorrow is the uh, will be the Entre Architect Network Business oh, yeah. Summit from noon to 5 p.m. So go to uh, network dot entrearchitect.com. If you're a member of that network, uh, join us for that tomorrow. Uh, I'm, I'm betting that Mark can share a link. If you're not a member of the network, an Eventbrite link that you can uh, register for that if you want. But we'll have uh, Shannon Lee from Win Without Pitching. We'll have Demetrius Lynch from Spaces Podcast. We'll have all three co-hosts of the She Builds Podcast. And we'll have Gene Cohn, founder and chairman of KPF, Cohn Pedersen Fox. Um, all speaking at our um, our business summit tomorrow. So just want to give you the heads up on that before we jump into this. Uh, what have I what have I forgotten? What have we not covered that we need to before we get started? I think we've pretty much covered everything except for okay. um, the status of the green room. The, yes, we we do have a, we have a, a guest in the green room. It is it's the new year. It has been well stocked with peanut M and M's, um, but you know, if if I were in the green room and somebody kept me back there for eight minutes and forty eight seconds, I would probably mm-hmm. have eaten all of the peanut M and M's by now. So definitely, we probably got to jump back there and see what's going on. <laughs> Is there maybe in a peanut M and M coma by now? We'll find out. All right, our guest today is a coach, a trainer, a ukulele player and a pie maker. His focus is leadership, development, transition, and emotional intelligence. He's the author of From the Ground Up, Stories and Lessons from Architects and Engineers Who Learn to be Leaders, and the co-author of the upcoming Coaching and Mentoring for Dummies. That might be something that we ought to read around here. Leo McLeod, welcome to Context and Clarity Live. Hey, hi, Jeff. How are you? (laughs) Good. It's great to have you here with us, Leo. Um, I, you know, the, it's such a, it's such a colorful byline, ukulele player, pie maker, mm-hmm. peanut M&Ms, the, you know, the whole bit. Yeah. Um, I really want to know, uh, I, I know we'll, I know we'll touch on pie. We'll, we'll just have to, but I want to know mm-hmm. how and when did you learn to play the ukulele? Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> debatable how good of a player I am. I'm probably still learning. Um, yeah. The thing is, you don't have to be good at ukulele. It's just, it's um, it's great yeah. fun yeah. anyway, just from the beginning. It is. Actually, it, so it's a great, it's a great instrument because anybody can play it. That's why every other person in the universe is a ukulele player now. You know, COVID hits, guess what? Ukulele sales, right? I'm sure like <laughs> The chat rooms will be like, yeah, I'm a ukulele player. I'd like to actually hear from the chat. Yeah, who plays from, ukulele out there? Yeah. If, if you don't play it, you live in a house with someone who plays one. <laughs> or you, you have a good friend who plays ukulele. Yeah, um, I don't play, but I do have one in the house. Yeah, I'm a, so I'm a singer and I'm a songwriter. And, um, but I didn't know music. I didn't really understand 
how to, um, you know, actually write music in terms of chords. I, mean, I would write lyrics and something would be in my head, but I had no way of actually um, chronicling it or communicating it to anybody. Um, I have a really good ear. It's come from a musical family. So I found that the ukulele was a super easy way to uh, start figuring out some really basic chords like G, C, D, E, A, that kind of thing. And once you do, you can like come up with a lot of songs. So I just started slow. You know, I just started with what I could do. And, you know, there's, they say a lot, most rock songs are about three chords anyway, kind of thing. So it's true. It's just, and they're all the same. They're all the same. So, so um, yeah. And then actually, I decided to pick up the ukulele bass or the bass ukulele. Mm. which is really like a big white body. I have it in back of me here. Is that the one with the rubber strings, the kind of big thick strings? I don't know what you're talking about. Uh -oh. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I don't play it that well, but I can only play Go Tell Not Roadie. That's my entire repertoire right there. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, let's see the strings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are those the ones? Yeah. Nice. Wow. Well, yeah. So anyway, I it's, you play like a bass. So it's not strong like you, so I had to learn that. See. So, oh, um, like a, like electric bass, you mean? Yeah, like an electric bass. So it's, it's really fun. So that's, I have a lot of stuff going on. I'm like writing a book, writing another book. I'm playing two instruments, making pie. I'm actually making beef stew today and I'm talking to you. Um, I'm doing it. Yeah. yeah, I like going on. I, 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 I was, did, I think, right? I yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I, yeah. I have one more related question, though. Do you play Scottish music? No, that's hilarious. Yeah, you think I should. I actually well, have. You know what I have in my closet here? I got to show you this. Uh, one. Give me a hint. I'll try to guess. A Scottish fiddle. Oh, it's no. fiddle. My fiddle's downstairs, so I can't show anybody. <laughs> Oh, your kilt. Is that a is that a McLeod kilt? No. no. No, but you know what? A buddy of mine in my poker group gave this to me and I don't have the nerve to wear it in public. I'm oh, I'm looking well. for the right opportunity where I can do it. Every time I see a guy in a kilt, I'm like, why well, don't I have my kilt on? There he's got his kilt. It looks pretty well, cool. You just have to go to a place where uh, that people expect you to wear your kilt, like some Highland games. You're in Portland, Oregon, yeah. right? Exactly. They're right. You got yeah. it. Yeah. Right. Got and then it. you just go and, and all you have to do is order some um order some of the appropriate hose before you go because then it'll look a little okay better. Like people just wear yeah. Tevas with their kilt. You can tell they don't wear their kilt very often. <laughs> I have some good boots for it. I do have some good boots for it. All right. Well just get the hose that goes I can't even remember what it's called. That goes up to your you know, it's like uh the knit yeah. Socks not, that go to your the, knees, basically. Oh, yeah, you know, I don't think my wife would have let me out of the house with it. That's the other problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Even, even if I got up the nerve to do it, she'd be like, "You're not going out on that." No. Are you kidding? I'm sure you would look great. I don't know. I think I think people in kilts look very. You know what I think I should do? Very. I should put it on. Just go to Fred Meyer and go get some bananas. That's what I should do. Just, just like a just a random right. shop, right? Low risk, right? I don't know any of those people. Right yeah. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. You you uh you jumped into the right conversation because uh Catherine plays <laughs> Scottish fiddle and, I do, and yeah. it sounds like awesome. she uh, probably hangs around with a lot of people that were killed. A lot of people. Where I hang around is no nobody even thinks twice about someone walking in in a kilt unless they're wearing tivas, awesome. and then in which case I love it. We do say like we, we need need to hang out. We yeah, we do. Well, you're a little far from me, but I know someday. I have, a family, I have family in the East Coast. You're in Massachusetts. I have family back yeah. there. So Portland, well, um, Portland, Maine. So Okay, well, I'll make you an apple custard pie when you come. Yeah, do that. So we were, we were talking about this before we get started. Um, I've been talking all week about the fact that Leo makes pies. It was in the introduction. Uh, Catherine brought up this recipe that she found. So I, I guess we've just really got to, we've got to go from talking ukuleles to pie. Where did you learn to make pie? Or, or no, no, that's on your website. I don't know what website. the secret is to your pie. Let, let's, that's on your website. Let's go a different direction. What is your favorite kind of pie to make? Mm. I, yeah, I thought about this a little, well, Chris, I always think about it. 
Um, Catherine was kind of talking about apple pie. So I have a question for the audience, the people out there. Um, does anybody know if a cosmic crisp apple is a good apple to bake with? It's a great eating apple. It's not that well known. Mm. Um, it's delicious, but mm -hmm. my sense is it would probably be pretty good. But, um, you know, my go-to is a Granny Smith, uh, but I like to throw in Jonathan's in there. I like to mix up the apples. Uh, yeah. Is that the yeah. secret? Yeah, yeah that, that is kind of one of the secrets is to mix up the apples. That you, have kind of, you have some that break down, some that hold their shape, some that are tart, some that are sweet. And yeah, yeah. I mean, most of the cooking and baking I do is whatever's in the freezer or the refrigerator, right? So okay. people say, well, what kind of pie is this? Well, it's blueberry, blackberry, raspberry, and banana. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I don't <laughs> that's, throw that's what there was, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That was <laughs> yeah, Whatever it's like, yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I don't even remember. It's just whatever's in the freezer, so. Hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's a soft skill, actually, being able to make food and bring it to people. It is. It's very I much a soft so. skill. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I like, you know, I was listening to your conversation with Mark on the Entree Architect podcast and some other um, some other shows that you've been on, you know, in interviews. And, and I love the story about, you know, hey, if you stick, if you stick these five training sessions out, I'll, be, I'll make you pie at the end. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Do, do, do most people need, need that sort of, um, um, you know, incentive, I guess? To me, that's a fantastic incentive, but do, do most people need that kind of incentive to go through leadership development training? Yeah, you have to bribe no, them to not, stay till the end. Not really, but but you know what's kind of funny about it is that I started it as, what's that song? I started I started a joke, I don't know, something like that. Hermit's Hermit or something like that. Anyway, I started it as kind of a, oh, this would be kind of a fun thing to do, and then it became really annoying. Right, because I'd walk in and people say, "Where's the pie? Where's the pie?" Last class got pie. Last class, I'm like, "Okay." I said, "I get it. I'll make you pie." So the pressure was on. The classes got bigger. I had to make pie, and it's I would work for certain times where they would just have like they're bringing. They want me to work with more and more people, so mm -hmm. I'm there all the time. And eventually, the president of the company says, "Hey, where's my pie?" Like, because I'm the guy writing your checks. Where's my yeah. pie? I'm like, extortion, right? I said, what do you want? Mm -hmm. What kind of pie do you want? So, um, yeah. I, I would think that, um, I, I would think that HR would start approaching you about the conflict between the leadership development training, the pie, and the, the uh, health insurance, you know, the, the metrics that people need oh, to hit to get the lower health insurance rates, but maybe not. Yeah, that's, um, Oh, well, I'll, I'll let you come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Either, um, people think cosmic crisps would be excellent for pie. That's the consensus in the camp, uh, just so you know. Yeah. And I the internet that. says they're ideal for snacking, cooking, baking, and entertaining. Entertaining. I know, <laughs> entertaining the apples. Well, what is the entertaining part of cosmic crisps? I don't crisps? know. Yeah, I, I was wondering. Like, I don't know. <laughs> we don't have them out here, so I'll have to try it. I think that's I think that's people doing other things with them. Um, personally, yeah, they're, they're they're there. yeah, yeah. Well, you you mentioned doing these classes, uh, you know, leadership development classes in these firms, and I was thinking about this. There, there's this great diagram on on your website. It's the sort of the mountain image, and it illustrates a transition through my career, right, from doer to manager to seller to to leader. And I was thinking about that in the context of our community here. And I think I may be wrong about this. So those of you in the audience, just correct me if I get this wrong, but I think that a lot of people, I think a lot of entrepreneur architects that go out and start their own firms, they, you know, they graduate from school, they go to work for somebody, right? They start to get experience. They get experience as doers. Maybe they start getting experience as managers, 
but at some point they make that break and go out on, on their own for, you know, whatever their reason is, there's a million reasons they might do that. But I wonder if there's not for a lot of us, uh, a little, uh, a break in that process where we get halfway up that mountain where we're surrounded by the resources of quote unquote, the firm. Now we go out on our own and we have to make the rest of that progress because you, especially if you have your own firm, you've got to sell, um, yeah. you know, move right. up, you know, you're, right. if, if you started it, you're at the top of that mountain just by default, you know, as a leader mm-hmm. of the firm. Mm-hmm. So what happens to people? Is, is there some sort of, you know, vacuum that you fall into when, when you, when you make a break like that, or are there any, any, um, uh, things mm-hmm. that, solopreneurs need to do to make sure that they continue mm-hmm. some sort of guided development in that mm-hmm. process, moving up that mountain. So you're saying what happens to those people who start out as firms and then go out on their own? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of the folks in the audience right now, they, you know, they went to work for somebody could have mm-hmm. been a large firm, could have been a small firm, but you know, mm-hmm. they, they got their experience, but at some point, they, they left, right? They went out and started their mm-hmm. own thing. And my suspicion is that a lot of that happened when they were in the management realm. I know there are some that have been in leadership at larger firms yeah, and yeah. such, but a lot yeah. of them were in the management yeah. realm, you know, the second, second um, layer in that mountain on, on your website. They went out, they started their own thing, and all of a sudden – they're thrown into the selling and thrown into the leadership. Mm-hmm. What do they do? How do, how do we, how do we learn this? Yeah. So I think there's, here's how I might answer it. Uh, no, here's how I'm going to answer it. Um, you know, it'd be interesting is to kind of reverse this whole thing. Like, I think mm-hmm. it'd be great if people started out in their career running their own business. Like mm-hmm. they started out that way. And they had an appreciation for everything that goes goes on with it. The responsibility of getting people, of get, getting clients, managing the projects, collecting on invoices, looking into insurance, um, doing all those things. I think it's, you know, if I'm going to flip this upside down, is that I think um, uh, the bigger question is, for people going out on their own, it's, it's the rude awakening of what it really requires to run a business, yeah. and and um, the complexity of that. I just was reading um, Mark Zweig's book, Confessions mm-hmm. of an Entrepreneur. Plug, Mark. Plug. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's very good. It's very good because it's not just about architectural firms. It's about run, running any business. Just yeah. like here's really what's here's what's involved in doing it. Have you read it, Jeff? Have you looked at it? I've not, but we had Mark on as a guest yeah. Um, yeah. right about the time it was published, I believe. Right, right. So yeah, recently. so I actually went and, went and bought it, and I think he's great, and he's got a lot of advice. But there's so much to running a business that people don't understand. That, I think, is the big rude opening and rude awakening. And, and I would actually, I think that's a great book for people to kind of look at. You know, the, one of the things that he kind of talked about, I'm just kind of not really specifically going in any direction here, just things that occurred to me is that he really talked about the value of having kind of an open book policy with your employees. Like, mm. let me let me show you. Let me open up the books. Let me show you where the money is. Not specifically mm-hmm. like what Jeff is making, what Catherine's making, but this is the salary bucket, right? And this is this is our rent and this is our utilities. And this is it's, these are the this this is all the stuff that's going up. This is what's coming in. This is what's going out. Here's how much I'm getting. And um, you know, Mark talks about the value of doing that, and I think that's that's really a smart move. Uh, and I mm-hmm. think it's no matter where you're at in a firm. If you're let's say you're at a firm, it's small, it's medium, it's large. I, mean, I think it could be really powerful to just um, start instituting or having a conversation among senior management and saying, hey, what do you think about opening your books and showing people? Because, you know, the big thing these days is that people want transparency, right? They don't want games. Yep. They want to work for firms that have good values, that are trying to do the right thing, and, and a part of that is being transparent about pay. Um, yep. So, yeah. 
So, so let's flip that idea around for a minute. I love that idea. I love turning it upside down. And I, I totally agree with you. I teach a, 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 a graduate level pro practice class and I run it as a business playing competition. So it's almost what you're talking about, right? It's giving right. them experience of coming up with the idea and putting the business plan together, pitching the business plan um, as, as their pro practice. But, but when you talk about, um, you talk about that transparency, you talk about what people want. Um, I also know right, that there's 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 a, st- a stereotype, if not a, a legitimate history, of architects um, being pretty closed, being very competitive, holding mm-hmm. holding their cards close to the vest, mm-hmm. and not being transparent. Um, mm-hmm. And we also run into situations where somebody says, "Hey, you know what? I'm a small firm." Right. I, I've mm-hmm. got two or three employees. I poured a lot mm-hmm. into these employees. I train them. I do all of these things, and then they go off and leave. Yeah. What do you say to that? Um, I'm I'm curious because I agree with everything that you said, and I and I know that there are people that are going, yeah, but. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so so there were, there were two things there, right? One was. Um, what remind me what the two the, those are those are two issues what, what, what were the two parts that you were curious about well I, I think it's i think it's maybe it's just one it's you're you're talking about transparency you're talking about um in, in a way at least emotionally investing in the people right. that are working there right um right. what happens a lot is that uh, and I think this is partially the nature of the business, but you know, somebody, somebody joins your firm, you train them up, um, oh. you, you invest in them in, in a number of different ways. And then they, mm-hmm. they leave, you know, they go, yeah. go somewhere else. Yeah. And so yeah. a lot of yeah. people will, or I shouldn't say a lot. Some people say, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to invest so much in them because they're just going to oh. leave. I'm, I'm training them. Oh. They're going to get good and they're going to leave. Oh. Well, they're going to leave if you don't invest in them. <laughs> you can't have it. I mean, it's just the way it is. I mean, and, yeah. and that's more that's more the case. It's like you know, I was talking to uh, uh, Mark about this. Do we say Mark LePage or do we say the whole Mark R LePage? <laughs> you, you can. You have to, you, you have to add is R. He R. Mark and tell well, me. I, you know, I don't know. Kath, Catherine is generally the rule maker around here. I'm the rule. I'm the <laughs> I rule breaker. I, I think you can. You know, between you and I'll me, I'll say Mark. I'll say Mark. Call, okay. You say Mark. Whatever. Call him LePage. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. just there's. He's no, not to be confused with Mark LePage. You know, that's just one of those things. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We we were talking about this. Um, you know, is it smart business to treat people right? Like, duh, of course it is. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, everybody, every, I mean, every client I have, every prospect, everyone I'm talking to is like, I can't find people. That's it. Mm-hmm. Like, that's it. And you know what? It's going to get worse. It just yeah. is. I mean, fewer people are entering the field. You know, there's some interesting studies indicating that people are just saying, yeah, I'm not going to get into this field. You know, just I'm going to find something else to do. Or the leaving. And, um, you know, it's interesting because my business started around 08 or 09, just when the recession hit. And there was this big glut of those mid-level senior people who yeah. left the field, right? And everyone was saying, we've got, we've got new people, we've got young people, but we don't have the people who can really do the work. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of boomers who were retiring and young people not coming up. So my... Long new way of saying it is that is that the the, the primary issue is attracting retaining talent. Yeah. That's what everybody wants. Everybody wants that. Well, how do you do that? Well, you don't just like ignore people. You don't say, "Well, I'm not going to invest in them because I'm afraid I'm going to lose them." You know why? Because like the next firm over is going to be investing in those people, and you know they hear from social media from their friends like, "Hey, just come over here. It's really awesome. We do all this great stuff." and you know, they're really, they're investing in us. What do, what do I mean by investing? I mean about, um, I do mean about coaching. I mean about training. It could either be about DEI. It could be about leadership. It could be just about like doing the work, like project management stuff. 
yeah. like BIM training. It's like just basic stuff. I don't know how many times I've run into situations where people aren't even getting the basics in a firm, like mm-hmm. project management. How do I manage a project? Like, really? Like, yep. you're not training your people to do that? So I, you know, I would start with the basics, invest in them because you need to do that anyway. And if you're doing that, you're getting people who are going to be able to contribute and raise the value of what you're doing for your clients anyway. I mean, it's, it's all just, all the arguments are for me are about that's where you just need to put your chips. Yeah. Yeah. We're, so we, we read a book every month for our Context and Clarity book club. And for January, we're reading Will Girdara's book, and I'm sure I butchered his last name, so apologies to Will, but but um, it's Unreasonable Hospitality. And I'm, I'm just, I'm a handful of five or six chapters in at this point. And one of the things that he talks about, I think is exactly what you're saying. Uh, he talks about this, I've, he's got a term for it that another restaurateur came up with, but it's basically the idea that they, they pour so much into their people into their personal and their professional development, that one that creates this alignment, right? Oh, I want to be there because they're pouring so much into yeah. me. And we're, we're all sort of right. in this together, right. headed in the same direction. Right. But where it, where it touches the hospitality piece of that is that they're pouring so much in that it starts to overflow to the customer, you know, in their context, the customer experience, we would call mm. it client experience. But, mm. but if we pour it into our people, they're going to, they're then going to pour that into the people that we work with, our, our clients. And mm-hmm. I, I think, I, I think that's a really good lesson for us. And I, I think it's a good argument for, Hey, what, what can I do? And, and maybe it's a conversation I need to have with, with my people. What can I do for you? What can I do for you? What can I do for you? How can I help? Um, I think, I think that's what, and correct me where I'm wrong, but I think that's what you're saying. And I think that's what I'm reading in the book as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also think to your point that let's say that, um, yeah, okay, let's use delegation because that's like a big fat juicy one. Like people say, well, what should I train on? Say, we'll start with delegation because that's encompass, encompasses so much. And and I, I spend quite a bit of time um, in the book talking about how to delegate. But if you were to invest in delegation, it's a skill, coach people on how to do it. Invariably, you're going to teach people how to listen. You're going to teach people how to articulate, set expectations, um, have regular check-ins, give constructive feedback, let go of projects, um, you know, uh, uh, let people kind of have their own authorship or ownership over design. And learn to switch your focus as soon as delegating work to something else. Now, if you do that, if you do that for your internal team, how does the external client benefit from that? Well, <laughs> they get they get a project manager who's been trained internally in project in delegation, who's better at listening to the client and their needs, better at about being uh, clear about where they're at the project what questions that they might need to ask someone, um, um, how to set expectations, how to check in, how to, how to be proactive on things. They're, they're going to be a better project manager for the client. So then the client's like, oh, this is really awesome. I'm not sure what, what they're drinking over there, but it's working. <laughs> they're eating apple pie is what they're doing. Very, yeah, that's what they're doing. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, so you mentioned the book and for those of you that missed the, um, our, our opening introduction here, the book that Leo is talking about is from the ground up stories and lessons. There it is. Awesome. There it is. Stories and lessons from architects and engineers who learned to be leaders. Um, I, I know, I know that it's partially framed around, and I, I was reading, was reading what's on your website and different blurbs, and listening to uh, uh, interviews. I haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but um, I know that part of it is, hey, what happens when someone comes and and um, says we want it, we want you to move up into this leadership role, um, which maybe some in our our audience have experienced, and they remember that. Uh, and I also wonder. 
for entrepreneur architects. Um, is is there a big takeaway from the book for somebody that's that maybe saying, "Hey, I think I want to go out on my own," or someone that has recently gone out on their own, or maybe even people that have been out on their own for fifteen years? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So I would use this analogy. You know, um, attorneys uh, basically share resources and have their own businesses, right? Mm -hmm. If you're in a law practice, if if the three of us are in a law practice, Jeff, you got your clients, Catherine, you got mine, and and, and I have mine. We get together and we make kind of firm-wide decisions, but most of my work is working for... Uh, you know, for my clients. And, and I think that if, um, if people can start thinking about really owning that job of what it takes to really kind of run a business, um, you know, the, the book really started from a demand that people wanted to move into a position of leadership and take on more responsibility. Um, but, they were kind of stressed out, freaked out by it. They were overwhelmed, mm-hmm. overwhelmed by by suddenly taking on the work. Um, and it is very much like that attorney situation where you know you 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 really kind of have your own book of business, and there's so many different things that you you need to to watch and take care of. Um, you know, the book to a large degree started when I used to do more communication training and I used mm-hmm. to do more what it takes to be a leader, especially for architects and engineers and how to get work. So I did a lot of business development training. And then what happened is that things got really super busy and people didn't need work anymore. They needed to manage what they had. And I walked into a training with, um, it was a Seattle agents or a firm, rather, architectural firm. And they just promoted six people, not from being an associate to be managed, managed principals overnight. I'm not like, let's just skip the principal part. You're now managing principal. What's that mean? It means you're making decisions for the office. You're in charge. Go for it. And they're freaking out. They're like, I, they you know, what? Be. Yeah, like, what? Now, what am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to manage this? And you know, I had people crying and freaking out, stressing out. I'm like, oh, I think I need to change what I'm doing here. I need to help people with delegation, managing their time, saying no, managing distractions, determining between urban, oh, what's important, what's urgent, um, you know, time blocking, uh, managing email, managing meetings, working more effectively, efficiently. So I have to, that's a lot of what I have to do because if I don't address the time management issue, people are saying, I don't even have time to read your book. I don't even have time to look at the last assignment or think about what the heck we actually talked about last time. I don't have the time. People kept saying that. I'm like, well, I think it's kind of obvious I need to help people get the time for them to, to move on. So that, that's, that's, a, that's a big building block for me is that if you're looking at well, where do you start, you need to you need to work smarter and figure out some strategies so you have the time to do the reflection, to do the networking, to do the professional development, to do all the things that are going to elevate your firm and make it profitable. Well, that is um, that's a reality for I think everybody that's in the audience right now, whether they're at a larger firm or their own. You know, maybe they're a sole practitioner because that. Um, you know, managing that time and juggling all the things I, I like to say, you know, as a small firm owner, you're wearing all 17 hats of the entrepreneur. Right. And that's, right. that's one thing that a lot of, uh, if not everybody in, in our community, um, probably suffer from on a, on a day-to-day basis. So when you, when you do those trainings, when you made that, that pivot and you started doing those trainings, I mean, yeah. are there foundational building blocks or is it you know is it just situation by situation how do you approach that well so because i like stories so let me share a story so yeah. i'm working with a stormwater engineer 
civil engineer who focuses on stormwater. And senior guy, really knows his stuff, well regarded by the client, heavily in demand. And you know, the expectation is that um, when a client says, yeah, we're going to hire you, the firm, they, they're going to get this guy, they're going to get Josh. So Josh's mode is to get into CAD. Like, okay, I know how to do this. So I'll just open up the program and start doing what I do. But he came to me saying, I don't want to be doing that. A lot of people come to me and says, I don't want to be in the weeds anymore. I want to be doing other stuff. I don't want to be in CAD or, or you know, doing kind of the, the tech work, the grow work. So I asked him, this is what I always ask people. I say, well, three years from now, how would your life look? What would be different personally and professionally? I call it your mountain, which is a big part of the, the book. It's like, where are you headed? What's important to you? Because I don't care where you're at, and I'm talking to the audience here, if you're a solo entrepreneur or if you're in a large firm, it still needs to be about what's important to you. Like, is the job working for me? Is it getting me to where I want to go? And if it's not, then something's wrong and broken. The first step on that is saying, what is important? What am I working towards? Not just in terms of my career, but also personally. And that's the work, that's the reflective type of work that people need to be doing in any kind of position for themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's also a skill that they can coach their employees to look at, too, because especially younger people want a sense of purpose. They don't want to just work. They want to work for a company. They, they want a sense of where this is going. And, mm -hmm. and I, I've had a lot of success engaging people on this very, like, what's in it for you kind of thing. You know, let's talk about what kind of projects you want to do, what kind of clients you want to work for. Let's be intentional about if you're going to do business development about who you want to work for yeah. and what skills you need to develop. And then you need to figure out if there's an overlap between what they want to do and what the firm wants to do. And then the last part is the skills you need to do develop. It's to develop those three different things that I think are really critical. But back to Josh, his mountain was to spend more time with his son. He was, uh, um, son was a Boy Scout, so he was the Boy Scout leader. And he's like, you know, this is, time slips by. This is the time I need to spend with him. So that was part of his mountain. He says, I want to spend more time. I don't want to be working nights weekends. Um, I'll be talking about practices for stormwater. I uh, mean, with people who are really involved in it, I don't want to be doing the work. Um, you know, and, and that's, that's what I want to do. So in order to do that, what he needed to do is stop opening CAD. And it became really intentional. My coaching was to say, look, number one, where do you want to go? Okay, that's your mountain. That's great. What, what's going to get you? going to get you closer. What's going to get you further away? Well, what's going to get me closer is delegating the work. And what's going to get further is any time I open up CAD. And I don't, you know, I think if there's anything that people get out of this conversation we have, it's that it's it's understanding where is it that you want to go, or even to coach your employees that way, and what are the good moves that are going to take you closer to your destination, and then being really structured and disciplined about that, and then lastly, getting the support, getting the support of people who can hold, keep you accountable, who can be allies and advocates and mentors as you, as you move forward. That makes sense. Yeah, there, it, it, it makes perfect sense. I mean, a lot of things come into my head. I mean, one, we, we talk a fair amount, especially we, we do this call every morning called our, our, uh, morning mindset call. And we talk about intentionality, which what you're saying um, a, a big part of that, I think, is intentionality. But um, yesterday, somebody mentioned that um, that sometimes, it, you know, I have to raise my hand to this too, right? How many times have have you had a task that needed to be delegated? That and and you know, maybe you have an employee that it needs to be delegated to or a, uh, a contract worker or a consultant or whatever, but it's a task that needs to be delegated. And you say, well, you know, it'd be faster for me to do it than explain how to do it, teach them yeah. how to do it. 
and, um, you know, been there, done that a lot of times. And I think of, to me, I think of it in terms, you mentioned investing before. I think of it in terms of investing and say, if this is a task or a role that is recurring, Mm -hmm. if I, if I invest that time to teach it, I'm investing Mm -hmm. in that person's development. Right. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. you know, are they going to do it the same way that I do it? No. Um, Are they going to do it as well as I do it? No, not the first time, but we go through it a couple of times. Eventually they're probably going to be, end up doing it better than I do develop their own systems and such. Mm -hmm. But it's also an investment in myself in that mm-hmm. it's, yes. they're going to take stuff off of my plate that opens right. up physical or, or mental space for me to get back to my highest and best use. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, I see mm-hmm. that as a, as a, um, a stumbling block a lot, I think, for small business owners. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that they don't let go of the work and they say, to, yeah. you know, I just do this myself. Well, um, so yeah, so... So there's two, two things about that. One is, look, we're, we're, a lot of us are involved in work, including me, where I'm, I'll be, like today, I have to tune into this program. I have to figure out whatever this is, restream, right? So I'm like, wow, it would be nice if I had somebody who could help figure this out. But it only took me about 30 seconds. I mean, there are some things that are like there. It's only going to take you a minute or two. It's like, just do it. Right. But if there's, there are things that I do do where I'm really conscious because I, where I'm like, I do this a lot, taking a lot of my time. I shouldn't do it. It's not that you my time. Somebody else should do it. And those situations are ones that you need to, to really, to really address. So, I, I don't have employees, but I outsource a lot. I outsource editing, I outsource marketing, yeah. I outsource website development. You know, there's and, and and I'm always looking to to ask myself that question: What am I doing with my time? Is this the best use of my time? Should you know now? Of course, you can find technological solutions like you know, yeah. just get Calendly to schedule appointments mm-hmm. instead of yeah. you know doing that. So, but but I'm always I'm always um against that. But the, the other thing I wanted to talk about, and it's it's just kind of a reality, is that you know, as you move up from being a doer to a manager to kind of a leader, that that naturally when you start delegating work, you have to let go of work. You have to like step back from it. And I think psychologically and emotionally that's really hard. Even if you think it's the right move despite everything I just talked about, like this is the right thing to do. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good because um, you get joy from it. It's what you're trained to do. Uh, you don't like doing other other stuff. It's hard. Like making people and having difficult conversations, keeping people accountable, checking in with them. Like this, this kind of sucks, you know. I just want to do the work. I mean, that's where, that's my happy place. You know, I had, I had an architect said, you know what? Some days I would just like to design something like even a birdhouse, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it doesn't need to be fancy. I'm just tired of doing kind of the admin work and the work that's sometimes involved in, in being a leader. And that, that is a, that's a real hurdle. It's a hurdle because, and I've seen people make this transition. You have to kind of stick with it and believe that it's the right thing to do because I've seen a lot of people after a while say, you know what, I'm getting a different um, source of satisfaction now because I can see mm-hmm. people develop and I can see people showing up instead of me at a meeting and them really um, stepping into their own. And that's cool, but that takes a while. And that's a, that's yeah. a hard transition. Yeah. I just wanted to mention it because it's a very, even if you think it makes sense, emotionally it's, it's hard to let go of the work. Yeah. Well, I, so is there a different approach? Maybe it's not a different, maybe it's a tangent or something. I don't know, but you know, you mentioned Josh, right? Stormwater engineer. Yeah. And, um, you know, he wants to be the thought leader. He doesn't want to jump into CAD, those types of things. Yeah. Yeah. If you're an architect that says, again, as, as you said, you, you have to know what you want to, you have to know what you want to get out of this. You have to know what mm-hmm. it is that you want to do. So if you're an architect that says, 
this is what I really love about being an architect. And it, it may not, as you said, and I see John Jones is, is uh, echoing that in the comments as well. It may not be the management. It may not be the business development, the, you know, all the, all the, the business of architecture stuff. I just really want to get back to being an architect, designing houses yeah. or bird houses or whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Yeah. Then is, is the, is the pivot then to say, okay, how do I get back to that and surround myself yeah. with the people that are going to yes. take care of all the other stuff? Yes, I agree. That's what's exactly. necessary. I don't think it's either, I, that's exactly what you're right. I don't think it's either or. I think it's a, what brings me joy? Oh, designing stuff. Oh, great. That's awesome. Well, what if I told you, what if I told you, Jeff, that we can come up with a program so you can have, instead of like zero hours designing something, you had... I don't know, four hours or six hours a week. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're still feeding that part. You may not be able to do it as much. And maybe that's a goal that you say, yeah, I'm going to work towards being able to do that more. But mm-hmm. what that requires is for you to be better at managing people, delegating, coaching them so they can be more independent. So there's that yeah. investment yeah, yeah. there. So Jeff, that yeah. may be your goal to want to be like, I just want to get back into ideas and I just want to get into the creative process, then you need to invest in getting good at that or, and not or, and I should say, enlist the help of other people, you know, especially their peers, some people who are really good at certain parts of work, make them mentors, make them teachers. It doesn't all need to fall on you. Um, there's a lot of different ways of doing it, but yeah, I, it's not an either or thing. It's it's mm-hmm. it's just being, I don't know, you know, kind of open and realistic about where you're at and what you want, and what you need. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. It, um, I'm going to moderate a panel. I think it's next week for a few AIA chapters, and and the what what warms my heart about the panel is there's a really broad spectrum in the three panelists from you know educating young people to you know early career mid career and and uh, pretty experienced and and i think one of the, we we had a call the other day you know, what are we going to talk about you know what's everybody's experience and i think the richness in the spectrum of people is that they're all on some level talking about getting the joy out of the profession, not, not taking the joy out, but getting joy out, you know, receiving joy from, from, from what they're doing and, and the pursuit of that. Um, and I think that's something that, that we need to have in our leadership development programs. Um, as, as we look at, this is, this isn't a great segue, I know, but as, as we look beyond our firms to the profession and the future of the profession. Um, There are leadership development programs out there. Um, There, in my opinion, there's not a lot of it going on inside of, of academia, right? They're, they're not learning a whole lot of leadership development academia. I think we have a responsibility, right? We we've been around a while, a few years, a bunch of years, whatever, whatever everybody's context is. I think we have a responsibility to help the next or help emerging leaders, help uh, emerging architects, et cetera. What's, what's the number one thing we need to look at, you know, I think I would say profession wide in terms of making sure that somebody that's graduating in May or somebody that's been out for a couple of years that they're mm-hmm. able to accomplish what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Well, let me throw this thought out because I think I'm going to end up kind of colliding with that. So okay. um, I'm kind of go back to what we were talking about earlier. I'm going to loop this in and see if I can do it. Is that, you know, we talked about really finding joy in doing the work, right? Mm-hmm. And people who are drawn to this industry are not drawn to the idea of doing business development and 
you know, spending time in spreadsheets and, you know, filling out reports and, and being in really long meetings. And they're not. It's just about it's what I'm about. So let's say you're somebody who's just entering that field. You know what? People are looking at the firm leaders, the people who've been there, maybe who've been there for five years, 10 years, who are running the firms. Like, well, what's their life like? Like, what do I get to look forward to? Right? What's happening? So, so. If you spend time on yourself, finding more balance, having more discipline about how you spend your time, being better at delegating, so you can have more balance in the things that you should be doing, those younger people are going to be coming in saying, oh, there's, it's not all work. Look, like millennials and Jesus, they don't work, they want to work all the time. Like, yeah, no, <laughs> who does, right? It's like they want more balance. So show them by modeling it, that it's possible to do it. So how do you do that? This is what I tell people. Look, get rid of the stupid things that you're doing that take up a lot of time. Like, mm. if you're in like a owner, architect, contractor meeting, that's like six hours, like that's not a good use of your time. Now, you say, I have to, because the client, you know, expects me. That's what I would work on. I work on a strategy of setting expectations in the beginning of the relationship and saying, look, there's going to be some meetings I'm not going to be in. I'm going to be sending junior people in. If I do that, it's going to be, it's going to be less costly to you. And it's also going to get the job done. And I can focus on other stuff for you, but this is it. This is how we work as a team. You set that expectation front. People don't, people don't have this, these clear conversations about what my role is and what my team is. They don't come to it as I have a team. They come to it like, I'm doing all the work and you own me. And I think that's a good place to start is to is start setting expectations with clients, especially new ones and saying, We're, we have a team approach here and I'm going to introduce you to my team. And there's a lot of people who are involved in it. This is how part I'm going to play. When people don't do that, the clients feel like they can own them 24 seven. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think it makes total sense, and I and I and I do think that's one of the places we talk about this a lot um, on context and clarity is whether we call it setting boundaries, setting expectations, communicating those things. Um, that's 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 great advice to to really start with with those types of things. I like that. I like that. I like and I, stupid, I, sorry, stupid, go ahead. Stupid stuff. Like, really, are you like you're in email for like all day? It's like, stop doing that. Right. So let's mm. talk about some strategies for not doing that. Because uh, you know, you have to play this game. If you don't do that, the world doesn't stop. You just people. We're so reactive to stuff. Yeah, we're. we're I, I say we're always responding to the urgent. Oh, someone texted me. Someone called me. I got an email. I got to respond. And that, next thing you know, you don't have any time in your day. Like that's where right. you start. You start like not being reactive. You know, you you you, you know. Um, like Mark's a good example. Like, my, if I, I'll, I'll text Mark about, or I'll email Mark about something. I know he's, he doesn't respond right away. I have a sense that he's structured about this is when I'm going to reply to this person. He's, you know, he's, he's intentional about it. And, yeah. and, you know, that, that I think is really kind of the key to having more space. And it's good modeling for, for future employees. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. really is. Sorry, go ahead, like, Catherine. Well, I was just going to say, I, I signed up for your mailing list, and I just really appreciated the uh, 10 t steps to getting your time back. Oh, there you go. Right? I just, already, I just said a bunch of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just, yeah, it's because it's time. Like today, where did today go? I don't even know. And I, no. the more I don't get things done, the more I have to do tomorrow. And then it's just, you know, snowballs yeah. makes it not yeah, fun. I want, to bring, I want to bring in a personal thing because I am right now I'm standing at my desk. Usually I'm sitting. Yesterday, my wife said to me, you know, I noticed you're getting kind of sedentary. <laughs> and you know what? I was like, hmm. Like, I love my wife because she's really honest and direct. Uh, but I know she's concerned about me, and she knows I care about my health. My mountain, I'm 66, is to remain super healthy. Last fall, I did 275 miles to the Camino. I want to be able to do play racquetball. Wow. I want to continue to do stuff. And in order for me to do that, guess what? I can't be sitting on my ass all day. So when she knows that, 
that's part of our shared mountain. So when she's giving me that feedback, I, I listen to that. I'm like, yep, you're right. So I did 25 minutes of yoga today. I'm at my desk. I'm standing. I really want to sit down. But I didn't do all my New York Times word puzzles. I only did Wordle because that's quick. But I didn't use spelling bee because that takes too long. But I, it's about being intentional. I, where am I going with this? Where I'm going with this is understanding where is it you want to go, what's meaningful for you, and what are the steps you can take by saying no to certain things, saying yes, and structuring your time, and, mm. and, and and just being more intentional about it. And it really requires other people helping you do that, having allies, having advocates, having mentors. Yeah, I love it. There's a lot that we could learn. I, this is another one of those conversations. Like, can, can you hang out for another hour or two so we can keep this going? <laughs> um, no, you know what? I, I do want to say something, though. I want to, you know, when I connected with Mark, I thought, this is, he's so in line. And you, and now you're part of the my little fan club here. You know, what I mean is I'm a fan of, of what you're doing. And, and I was like, you know, these are people I just want to spend more time with. And that's another kind of philosophy of mine is that when you go find allies and advocates, find people who are like, like-minded and doing interesting things, yeah. not without any kind of game plan or agenda, just like we're speaking mm-hmm. the same language and I think yeah. we can support each other. And I'm not sure how it's going to happen, but I'm a really, over time I've become a big believer in that. Like you have to hang out with a, with the right kind of people and things yeah. happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I kind of think of it as collecting that's people. That's why I was excited when I got the and Mark. He's you know, like, hey, we got this other opportunity for you. I'm like, yeah, I'm there anytime. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we appreciate it. And I saw um, in the comments early on, I saw Ray Brown from Archibiz over in Australia oh, yeah, I saw Ray. Yeah. commented. Um, if, if you don't know uh, Ray, I think he's another person that you would like to hang out with. Another say that again, uh, Ray who? Ray Brown. Okay. At Arch- Archibiz, and they're based oh, in um, okay. Okay. Melbourne, I think. Oh, awesome! There you go. Yeah, he's a yeah. good guy. I like him. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Mark uh, Mark LePage says the proximity principle in action. It, it really is. It um, last week we mm-hmm. talked to Ken Coleman, who's the mm-hmm. uh, host of the Ken Coleman Show and the author mm-hmm. of the proximity principle. And and okay. you know what what you're talking about is 100 percent the proximity principle. So mm-hmm. um, yeah. it's the people that you're surrounded with. Yeah, it's great yeah. great advice. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And keep keep up the good work. You do really good stuff. I um, I got marks. Well. The whole toolkit. I don't know if people know about it. All the tools you get for the profit calculator. I was like, this stuff is great. You know, it's it's so many great resources. So, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, not, not enough time yeah. to look at them all. So we have to take your little <laughs> mini course on time management yeah. and then and work the, in the entrepreneur exactly. text. Yeah. Got it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. If you want to find that mailing list and the toolkits, um, Leo has his own toolkits on, on his yeah. website, go to Leo yeah. Um, and you can see it down in the bottom left hand corner of yeah. your screen you. right now. Also, yeah. uh, go over to Amazon or wherever, uh, you do books, you, you uh, buy books and get from the ground up stories mm-hmm. and lessons for, from architects and engineers who learned to be leaders um, and also get the Zweig letter. Um, Leo has mm-hmm. mentioned um, Mark Zweig of the Zweig Group, who many of you know has, has yeah, been, yeah. been a guest yeah. here before. Yeah. Um, uh, Leo contributes to the Zweig mm-hmm. letter, uh, mm-hmm. which is uh, their email mm-hmm. as well. And uh, we're going to mm-hmm. give you uh, Leo's uh, email address as well here. Uh, moment yeah, here. Right here. Just, you know, yeah, no, I appreciate it. I'm all about connecting with people who who are um, fascinating in this the subject and doing all interesting right. things. I wish we'd had more time to talk about um, emotional intelligence because that's something that I'm interested in. But next time, maybe you'll come back and yeah, talk to time. us about that subject. Yeah, that's yeah. Good. we'll have to we'll have to do it again. Okay, good, awesome, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, Leo, thank you very much for this conversation. Mm-hmm. And, and I really do feel like this is a starting point for yeah. future conversations. You're welcome back 
anytime. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, enjoy the opportunity to talk again on other topics in the future. I'm going to do it from my, next time I'll do it from my kitchen. Yes. I will. Okay. Yes, we would yeah. love that. <laughs> yeah. I'll make pie to do it because when I'm done here, I'm going to go make some beef stew. So yeah. We, yes. Yeah, we've got to do that. We've got to figure that out. That'll be fun. That would um, be fun. So, so thank you for that. Looking forward to that, and uh, to everybody uh, that's joining us today, either live or on the recorded version of this. We, we appreciate you. Um, I say this every week, and I really do mean it. Um, if it weren't for all of you making context and clarity a thing. This is our 91st context and clarity live conversation, our 670th or so um, context and clarity conversation. If it weren't for you, this wouldn't happen, right? We wouldn't have, we wouldn't have this conversation with Leo. We wouldn't be having all these conversations every day. So thank you uh, for all of this. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, As I said at the very beginning, will be live for the Entree Architect Network Business Summit tomorrow. Shannon Lee, Demetrius Lynch, all three co-hosts of the She Builds podcast, uh, Gene Cohn, and we'll wrap it up with context and clarity at the very end. Um, Join us for that tomorrow. There's a link in the comments that Mark posted, or if you're a member of the network, just go over into the network. It'll be there, right? Um, So thank you to all of you. Um, Looking ahead to next week, Let me click on this other tab and I'll tell you that our guest next week for Context and Clarity Live will be Alexandra Lang. She is an architecture critic in all the places. You're going to find her writing uh, in the New Yorker and in all types of places. She also has a new book out that we may touch on. It's about malls in America. So I think that's going to be a a fun little fun little twist next week talking with uh, Alexandra. She uh, spoke recently at Ball State and um, that's our that's our hookup there. So we haven't talked about malls yet on context and clarity. So we have not. It was yeah one of my so, favorite well, architectural subjects. It uh, mm. I know going all the way back to your thesis, right? Mm. <laughs> all right. Thank you everybody. We appreciate all of you. Please as always be well. Stay safe keep those around you safe and well find a little bit of time to breathe relax you may need to go over to leo's uh site and and get the uh the 10 tips for uh managing your time better so that you can breathe and relax find some way to rejuvenate we do this every day you've got to pace yourself thanks for going along this journey with us and we'll see you again tomorrow everybody thanks